So today we're going to talk about confronting deception with truth. Confronting deception with truth. There's an ancient story. I believe it's a, it's a true story. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's called the story of the Trojan horse. And that really stands as a, a powerful illustration of the, the devastating effects that deception can have. There was a war long ago between the Greeks who wanted to capture the city of Troy. But Troy had very strong walls. And the Greeks couldn't, could not break through the walls. And so they decided to come up with a plan. Somebody, some ingenious person, decided, let's build a large wooden horse. So they built this large wooden horse. And this horse was so large that some of their select soldiers, some of their select commandos could hide within the wooden horse. And so... As the war continued, they brought the horse. Well, first of all, the soldiers of the Greeks retreated. But they brought the horse and set it outside the city of Troy as a gift uh, to that city, a gift of surrender. And the Trojans were clapping. They were celebrating. The war is over. We've won. And look, we've got this wonderful horse. So we've, they brought the horse inside the city. And the horse sat there during the day, but that night, when the sun went down, unbeknownst to the people of Troy, the commandos came out of the horse. They unlocked the gates from the inside and let the Greek army through the gates, and the city of Troy was captured. This story of the Trojan horse serves as the illustration of how deception can infiltrate and destroy Individuals, different types of organizations, or even nations from within. Deception comes in many forms. It can appear harmless. It can appear beneficial. And so it's difficult, often difficult, to recognize it and to resist it. The Bible warns us of deception that we need to be careful about. Ephesians 6.11, these verses are also written out in your bulletin. You can follow along there as well as on the screen. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, when do you put on armor? When you're at war, right? So the only reason you put, it, put on armor is because someone, some enemy is attacking you. And this verse is written to each and every believer. If you're a believer, you are in a war whether you believe it or not. Who is your war with? Well, it says right here is the devil. The devil has many schemes. We're in a battle. The devil seeks to mislead us, to deceive us. And so we need to be able to withstand with the armor of God. Now, what are the schemes of the devil? They're all based on deception. They're all based on lies. And so just as the Trojans were unprepared when this horse was brought in, they were unprepared for the hidden soldiers, so we must be equipped to recognize, first of all, and understand the schemes of Satan against us. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan is a master of deception. He can disguise himself as something or someone that appears helpful, that someone appears holy, that someone appears righteous. The Mormon cult. We have a church of the Mormons just down the road. Not a Christian church. They claim to be. That's a deception. They are a cult. Satan disguised himself before a man named Joseph Smith years ago appeared as an angel Moroni, dictated the Book of Mormon to Joseph Smith. He wrote it down, and that was the beginning of this cult. Calls itself Christian, but does not believe in the Jesus of 
the Bible. We won't get into it anymore, but here's an example of Satan disguising himself as an angel of light. Deception often appears to be good. It appears to be something good. It appears to be something trustworthy, but we must look beyond the appearances and seek the truth. Satan, our enemy, is skilled at presenting lies in attractive forms. In fact, as we're going to talk about, every temptation that you and I have ever faced is based on a lie. Every temptation that Jesus faced was based on a lie. Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth is so very important. Believing and acting on falsehoods leads to bondage of many kinds. Believing and acting on the truth sets people free from bondage through the power of Jesus. It sets people free to follow Jesus. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way and the life. Jesus is the only truth. He's the only one that we should follow in life. God's word is truth. Following Jesus, putting on our armor, Believing in God's word prepares us to face the deceptions of the enemy. And so today we're going to continue in our study in the book of Acts. We're going to look at, into an account of Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 13. And we're going to learn how they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to recognize and to confront deception. We also must confront deception with the truth of God's word. We also must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to protect ourselves and to protect others around us. The story begins with the people we're going to talk about being engaged in spirit-led ministry. We're going to see that's something each one of us as believers should be engaged in. Our story begins in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers... Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So Antioch was a city. We've already been introduced to that a couple uh, chapters ago. It was a city that became a hub for reaching the Gentile world. We see important ministries were active in this, in this church. Ministries of teachers. Ministries of prophets. Prophets are, are people gifted by the Holy Spirit to give prophecies. Words from God that are important, were important for the church to hear. The church was... Together, they were worshiping God. They were fasting. I believe they were seeking God for direction as to what, should they should, what they should do in the future. And as they were doing that, the Holy Spirit spoke. How did the Holy Spirit speak? Was it a word coming through the ceiling? No, I believe it was through the prophets. That's why the prophets were there. Prophets spoke what the Holy Spirit wanted to accomplish Barnabas and Saul were to be set apart for a special missionary work. We already know that Saul had been called primarily to reach the Gentiles, but he also reached out to the Jews as well as we'll see today. Verse 3, after fasting and praying, they, the church leaders, laid their hands on them, Barnabas and Saul, and sent them off. Why did they fast and pray some more? One of the things that God's Word teaches us is that when you hear a prophecy, you need to judge that prophecy. You need to make sure it's from God. And I believe they were praying. Is this really, this prophecy, is this really from God? We're going to fast, we're going to pray to confirm it. And they did. There was a consensus among the leaders. This was God's direction. They laid their hands on Barnabas and Saul, prayed with them, and sent them off on their missionary journey. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So these two men were sent out by the Holy Spirit 
to preach the gospel to people on that island. And of course, Cyprus still exists today. It's a big island. Let's think about what happened in the passage so far. Barnabas and Saul had a calling from God to be missionaries. And yet they didn't just set out on their own. God called us, let's go. They didn't do that. They were active, they were involved in a local church. Under leadership there. And while there, the church leadership was used by God to set them apart, to confirm that call, and to send them out on this mission. And so they went out, not on their own, but with the blessing of a larger body, the local church, the blessing of the church leadership. The Holy Spirit led them to begin ministry work on the island of Cyprus. And as we read the scripture closely, the island had been the birthplace of Barnabas. So he knew it well. At this time, the Cyprus had a notable Jewish population, so they would be able to reach both Jews and Gentiles. So we're learning some principles about believers being engaged in spirit-led ministry. I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches, that each and every believer has a calling of God on their life. If you're a believer here today, God has a calling on your life. God has a purpose for your life. Every believer is called by God to be a witness. And even though we might use the word a little bit differently today, I believe in essence, to be a witness is to be a, wish a missionary. It's to spread the gospel to the people that do not yet know Jesus Christ. Many are called to be witnesses right in their hometowns, on their jobs, in their neighborhoods. You don't have to be called to a foreign land to be a witness for Jesus. God, through the Holy Spirit, directs each of us to our special mission field. How do we know the specifics of our calling? Who are we to reach? We need to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Our church family can confirm and encourage you in your calling. We don't just go out on our own. We go with the backing of the Holy Spirit and the things we're called to do. Some may be called to other places, including lands across the ocean. We contribute to those missionaries, as John mentioned, through giving, our missions giving. Because God calls each one of us to spirit-led ministry. Now let's see what happens when you get involved in spirit-led ministry. We're going to have to, and they had to, confront spiritual deception. Verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. So this team of Barnabas and Saul began to preach the gospel on this island of Cyprus. And um, they began in the Jewish synagogues. Jews then, as today, need to believe in Jesus to be saved. Some people have the erroneous uh, view that Jews are saved. They, we don't need to preach the gospel to them. Jews are not saved. They haven't believed in Jesus, the coming Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. They need to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. And so Paul was preaching to the Jews. They then encountered an attack, an attack from the devil through a man named Bar-Jesus. Now most likely, if you understand the, the times, most likely Bar-Jesus was an astrologer. We still have astrologers today. Astrologers was very common in the ancient times. An astrologer is someone who, who looks at the movement of the planets and the stars and uses those to give prophetic words about the future. What they believe those signs in the heavens are telling about the future. And this is what Bar-Jesus was doing. His name, Bar-Jesus, means son of Jesus, which is quite ironic. He was not a follower of Jesus. He was a false prophet. He was of Jewish heritage, and yet if you read the Old Testament, astrology is condemned as something that faithful Jews of that time should not do. This Bar-Jesus, verse 7, was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, 
a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So Bar-Jesus appears to be a right-hand man of the Roman governor of the island of Cyprus, Sergius Paulus. And most likely, he gave his false prophecies to the governor and in a way controlled what the governor did. He would say, I'm looking at the stars and the sun and governor, you should do this. and You should not do this. He had control of that governor through his astrological prophecies. And undoubtedly, he got paid by the governor. It was a, probably a lucrative position. The governor sought out Barnabas and Saul. He heard they were on the island. They were preaching some different type of teaching he never heard before. He wanted to hear what they had to say. He desired to hear the word of God. While Elymas, that word means sorcerer or magician, didn't like it. He saw his influence over the governor slipping away. And so his words and actions were intended to stop the governor from hearing, from listening to God's word as taught by Saul and Barnabas and believing in it. So what did Saul do? They say, well, I guess we'll just have to move on. You know, this Elymas is uh, telling the governor not to listen. I don't, I don't know. I guess, you know, we shouldn't rock the boat. We should just move on. Uh, that's not what he did. Deception and lies must be confronted by those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. What did he do? But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. He gave him the, the gaze, you know. Uh, he looked intently at him. In this verse, Saul is beginning to be called by his Roman name, Paul, and shortly thereafter, he's just going to talk about Paul as we get through the book, as we go through the book of Acts. But it's very important to notice the first thing God's word says here before we find out what happened next is Saul, now called Paul, was what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. The actions that he did, the words that he spoke were words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So lest we criticize Paul as we go on with the story, we have to recognize these what happened and the things he did were inspired by the Spirit of God. Paul looks intently at this false prophet, Elymas. He's using deception and lies to oppose the truth of God's word. He's using deception to try to get this governor, Sergius Paulus, to turn away from hearing the truth he needed to hear. So Paul looks intently at Elymas. He was not going to let the deception go. He was going to confront it with the truth and power of God. So spiritual deception, including deception of all kinds, must be confronted with God's truth. So whenever you or I seek to share God's truth with someone, or in some, um, some type of way, Satan is going to oppose it. You've got to believe it. It's always the case. So don't be surprised. You're going to face resistance, perhaps from the person, perhaps from somebody else, perhaps internally. Satan will whisper in your ear, hey, you don't want to rock the boat here. You don't want to destroy this relationship. Just keep quiet. Don't do anything. Yes, they're going the wrong way, but hey, you know, just let them go. It's not, it's not your place to speak to them. It's not your place. Let them decide. Well, Paul didn't let the governor decide what to do. The governor was leaning in the wrong direction. At the Council of Elymas, he didn't want to hear the word of God anymore. So, <clears throat> Satan always opposes God's truth with deceiving lies. And those lies may come from various sources today in our own lives. The lies of the enemy may come to us from friends, from acquaintances, from workmates. The lies of the enemy may come from mass media. Satan's deception is deeply rooted in all kinds of mass media today, whether movies, television, news broadcasts, social media, books, 
videos, the internet. We could go on and on. There's lies all around us. Every temptation that you face is based on a deception or lie of Satan. How did Jesus confront Satan's deception, Satan's lies, when he was in the wilderness? He confronted it with the word of God, with the truth of God's word. That is how you overcome a lie. That is how you overcome a deception, with the truth of God's word. That's why it's so important for us to know the truth of God's word and to What does our vision statement say? Spread God's truth to those around us. Let's say it again because we've all forgotten. Our vision is to spread God's truth. Come on, let's use arms with this, okay? Ready for spread God's truth. Okay, now you're going to remember that. So um, we are to spread God's truth. Knowing and using God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit helps us, first of all, to discern deception. If you don't realize you're being lied to, if you don't realize this is a deception, uh, you're going to fall for it, right? First of all, we need to discern what is true and what is false. Once we discern that it's a lie, once we discern it's deception, then we can reject it and or confront it. The Holy Spirit will help us to confront and neutralize that deception. We must learn to confront spiritual deception of all kinds. And then we will witness God's power in action. Verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Now we've read that, but I'm reading it again because it's so important. Otherwise we would criticize um, Saul here. What did Saul say to Elymas? You son of the devil. Nice words, right? You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He wasn't kind and gentle, was he? This needed to be addressed. This needed to be confronted. And this was all true. Everything he said was true. Everything he said was through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit as he spoke those words. He identified Elymas, first of all, as a son of the devil. Those who promote deception, those who promote lies, in fact, I might say it, everyone who's an unbeliever actually is. You're either a child of God or you're a son of Satan. There's only two things. God's word, the gospel, is very binary. It's either one or it's the other. But in this case, specifically, he was lying, he was causing deception. Those who promote deception are, in fact, enemies of the righteous. They're full of deceit. They're full of fraud. They lead people astray. People that are walking away from God, the Bible talks about they're walking on crooked paths. Crooked paths away from God's will. Whereas believers are walking on straight paths. You can see that throughout the book of Proverbs. The crooked and the straight. That's not where Saul or Paul stopped. Verse 11. He says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, speaking to Elymas, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So Saul pronounces, or Paul, he's Paul now, Paul pronounces the judgment of God on Elymas upon this false prophet. He was made blind for a time through the power of God. And I also believe it gave him an opportunity to repent. Now we don't know whether he repented or not. As the magician needed his eyes in order to practice astrology to view visually the movement of the planets and the sun, well, that was taken from his him as well. Now this judgment was only for a time. We don't know what happened after uh, he gained his sight back. But God can bring judgment on those who oppose the gospel and seek to deceive others. What happened next? Verse 12. Then the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, the governor of Cyprus, believed when he saw what had occurred 
for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The proconsul was amazed at the power of God. The message of the gospel that was proclaimed by Barnabas and Saul was not just in words, it was in words, but it was also in power. So this combination of the word of God with this visible power of God caused him to reject the counsel of that sorcerer, of that magician. And more than that, he didn't just reject the deception, he became a believer in Jesus Christ. We'll see him in heaven someday. Of quite a story to say, to tell. So as we confront deception with God's truth, we will see God's power in action. So how can we confront deception in our own lives? First of all, we need to be concerned about ourselves. We must confront the deceptive temptations of Satan in our own lives with the truth of God's word. If you have a besetting sin, and most of us have some sin that we struggle with, if you're honest with yourself. If you're thinking here today, I have no sin I struggle with, um, you're deceived. <laughs> you're deceived because Satan knows our weak points and he's going to tempt you in those weak points. He might, you know, and he, another lie, he'll say, well, that sin isn't so bad. <laughs> a lot of worse sins out there. You know, you're pretty good. Uh, but every sin is something that needs to be dealt with. We need to confront deceptive temptations with God's word. If you have a besetting sin, and if you think about it and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you, we all do. Ask God to show you a scripture that will help you to confront or to resist that temptation. Our example is Jesus. Satan tempted him. Jesus responded with the word of God, with the truth of God's word. You may also may need uh, to have other believers around you to help you to be accountable with whatever you're going through. And that's why it's so important to be involved in a small group where you can be honest and open with people and they can pray for you and they can hold you up through prayer and be with you when you're going through a tough time. What about lies that you see in those close to you who are being deceived? Again, we need to speak the truth of God's word into their lives. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in order how to do that. We all, must always remember we're speaking the truth in love. Was Paul speaking the truth in love to Elymas? I believe he was. This man needed to recognize where he was coming from. The man needed to recognize that he was following Satan and not God. Now whether he responded or not, I don't know. But that truth was spoken in love. To speak in love does not simply mean to, oh, yeah, come on, say you should change. You know, it may need to be uh, forceful. It may need to be very direct to speak the truth in love. Sometimes we need to speak the truth in love to those close to us that are wandering from God. Uh, sometimes we need to perhaps guide them to read something or to watch something. That is the truth that we give to them. Sometimes we need to invite them to come experience God's word and God's truth in a small group, in a church meeting, or whatever it may be. Simply spread God's truth as God directs us. What about the deception we see every day in the news? Well, we can't directly influence the news, can we? I, I don't have the end to tell somebody not to broadcast false news or deceptions in the news. But we can... In conversations with others, if it comes up, we can speak God's truth. What is true and what is false. We must not be silent in a time when lies are all around us. What about the deception? <clears throat> well, let's just say, simply spread God's truth as God directs you. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Remember, how did Paul know what to say to Elymas? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. As we're filled with the Holy Spirit, God will give us the words to say. We spread God's truth. As, as, it is as if we are planting seeds into people's hearts and lives as we spread God's truth. And those seeds over time will grow up and bear fruit. You might speak the truth through a phone call, through a conversation, an email, a text, a social media post, a YouTube video, a blog, or 
You might even write a book. We have an author in our midst uh, today, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie has written a book, and it's coming out very shortly. It's called Finding the Grace to Grieve. Is that correct? And so we're very proud of Stephanie. She is spreading God's truth in a way that maybe not all of us can do. But God has gifted her to write that book, and I encourage you. I believe it's available for pre-order now, is it not? So uh, you can find it. I'm looking forward to reading it and praying that God will use that book to spread God's truth and impact many people's lives. As we do our part, we will see God's power in action. 